Okay, so I'm gonna go through controlled rectifiers here. Um, one of the biggest things to talk about the uh, control part of this rectifier is that when we talked about diodes, all we talked about was the diode being forward or reverse biased. When it was forward biased, it conducted. When it was reversed, it didn't and acted like an open switch. The thing was, is when it was forward biased, it produced, it pushed the whole uh, alternation through to the load. Because when it's forward biased, it's conducting. With an SCR, we have this addition to our, it looks like a diode, so we have our regular anode and cathode, but we have this addition here of the gate. What that is, is, is another, think of it like another switch that has to be closed in order for it to conduct. So we already have our switch that's based on whether we're forward or reverse bias, whether that's closed or open. Now we have a gate that has also acts like a switch that needs to be closed. So we have two conditions that need to be met before this SCR fires. Now we can take advantage of that too, is if we fire it later in the alternation, we would get less voltage across the load. So we can have voltage control with an SCR, which can be a huge advantage depending on the application. So again, it's drawn similar to a diode, but has one extra lead called the gate. Some types and configuration goes through in the module, flat pack or tab style, stud mount, and puck style. So here's a tab style one. Again, it's got our anode, our cathode, got our gate connection. So we should see three connections here instead of just the two, which, what's, is, which is what we were seeing for a diode. Uh, again, the tab is usually built to a heat sink. We want to, again, get rid of that heat that, that is created by these um, electronics pieces of equipment, these solid state devices. So we mount them to a heat uh, sink to get uh, that heat dissipated off of them. Again, this style is good for, typically good for low current from two amp to 20 amp. The stud mount is for medium power circuits. Again, the threaded stud is generally the anode. That's what we refer to that as. We have our cathode still, and then we have the gate connection. Okay, again, we're gonna have three points of contact on these SCRs because we have that extra gate. Um, another style is a hockey puck SCR, distinguishable from the hockey puck diode because of the small terminal pin. So this guy right here. So this would be the diode. This is the SCR because it has that gate connection for us. And again, use heat sinks to dissipate that heat. If we do, they got to be um, have layers of grease on them so that we have good heat transformer, or sorry, we have good heat transfer uh, so we don't get air, air pockets in there that create heat on them. Okay, um, some of them even have sensors embedded in them to turn on a light, letting the operator know that the current may shut down if it continues to heat up. Okay, so again, dissipating that heat away from these is critical. We don't want heat going to our electrical components or they will potentially um, destroy. So again, cathode is a terminal connected to the more negative side of the circuit. The anode is connected to the more positive side. The gate terminal is connected to a triggering circuit that controls the SCR. Again, if they're talking about the anode being positive and the cathode being negative, that's in regards to it being forward biased. So here's kind of an explanation of, of how this is working. So we go back to the PN junction. Um, and the, the, what I was talking about before with the two conditions that need to be met with this, uh, with this SCR. So in order for it to start conducting, um, we need to have a gate pulse basically applied to that gate and we need to be um, forward biased. So once it starts to conduct with that gate pulse, it's going to basically stay on until it's made to turn off, whether it drops below that current or whether we commutated it another way. Okay, commutate means to turn it off. Under normal conditions, an SCR can turn on if it's forward biased, and uh, so that's when the anode is positive with respect to the cathode, and a current pulse is applied from the gate to cathode. After it turns on, again, it will remain on as long as the current is equal or greater than the holding current, which is about one milliamp for every amp of the rated anode current. So if we look at this structure here, this is kind of the, uh, I guess, a, a more in-depth version of this SCR with our PN junctions. <clears throat> so it says the structure of an SCR can be described as two PN junction diodes or two switches in series. The bottom switch closes when the current is applied to the gate. So think again, this K, this cathode, this is negative. So we have a negative right here. And if we apply a positive, 
pulls to this gate. Now we have a positive here on the on the on that side of the PN junction, and <clears throat> we have a negative here. So that would close this this switch. So this one right here that they're kind of showing you. If I put a positive gate pulse and the cathode is negative, this closes. Now what it does is it kind of then brings the negative that was down here, brings it up to this point right here. And if my anode is positive because I'm um, the polarity of the source, if my anode is positive and I've carried the negative through this closed switch now and it's negative here, positive here, I will be forward biased and this switch will close. Okay, so the bottom switch closes when the current is applied to the gate. Once the bottom switch is closed, the negative potential of the cathode can reach the end terminal of the top PN junction. Okay, so right here. This causes the top switch to close since it's now forward biased. Once it is conducting, the gate connection can be removed and the switch stays closed as long as the current doesn't drop below the holding value. Okay, so once it's pulsed and once the switch closes, it's gonna stay that way until the current drops below that value. Okay, so that's kind of the, the buildup of the SCR. Think of it as two switches or even two diodes that we have in there. This one is forward biased, so it's gonna close. This one is also going to be forward biased because of this positive gate pulse uh, that we're going to put through it. So this gate pulse, how are we actually going to put this positive um, pulse to the, the gate itself, that wire? So a simple method is to cause current flow by the means of a push button. Okay, We just basically push this button, it goes through the resistor, and that current's going to hit the gate. Although a low current, again five times the minimum gate current, can be used to trigger, it's more effective to allow a spike of current to flow very quickly. Gate currents must be limited by some method. Okay, so we have this resistor here limiting that current. Um, you can accidentally turn on an SCR in several ways. So accidentally turning on would be triggering the gate without intention. Okay, so I'm not pressing this button to trigger it. The module kind of goes into these three scenarios where we could accidentally get a gate triggered. Um, and we just talk about them because they're mentioned. Okay, so if we exceed the breakover voltage, if we had voltage fluctuations or temperature changes, we can actually accidentally uh, pulse that gate. If the breakover voltage is exceeded, it turns on, losing gate control of the SCR, and the leakage current increases until it's equal to the gate current, turning it on. Okay, so that's one way it could accidentally um, gate the SCR. Another way is if an SCR is subject to high or sudden high rates of voltage change from anode to cathode, the capacitive charging current of the PN junction with the SCR may not, or may be enough, sorry, to trigger the gate. So what that means, there's, think of the, the when it talks about the capacitive charging current, when we have a SCR, even though the one switch could be closed, the other one could be open um, if there's no gate pull. So the one could be closed, due to the fact that um, the, it's forward biased, but it still needs that gate to basically bring that negative through. So if that gate gets triggered, it's gonna bring that negative potential from the cathode up to the, um, the top part of that switch back in this diagram here. So if we don't have this gate pulse, then we don't have the negative here. So even though the anode is positive, the negative is just sitting here waiting and if it doesn't reach this, then this won't close. So under that condition, <clears throat> we think about the PN junction. And we have, when it's uh, reverse bias, we have the electrons kind of moving away from each other and creating that, that potential in there. That's why it's acting like a capacitor at that point. Um, and if we get different rates of voltage change, so if, if it takes faster or we get a spike from something, we, that could accidentally trigger the, um, the gate as well. So to prevent that from happening, they use an RC snubber circuit. So RC, we have a resistor and a capacitor in this circuit that's parallel across the SCR. Um, and it's connected across, again in parallel, to attempt to limit the rate at which the voltage can increase. The voltage across the capacitor builds up at a slow rate such that the change in voltage and change in time across the capacitor is too small to turn on the SCR. So if this value, this change of voltage and time gets too high, we can actually see um, the accidental gating, okay? 
And how that happens, don't worry about the, the greasy uh, ins and outs of that. Just know that that is a scenario that, that can happen and, and accidentally trigger it. Uh, the internal resistor of the SCR connected from gate to cathode prevents charge buildup across the junction. If the charge exceeds 0.7 volts, it could falsely gate the, the SCR. The last way is an increase in temperature. It causes leakage current for, to double for every 10 degrees Celsius. This could also eventually trigger the gate, so caution must be taken to avoid large temperature increases. And also reinforces the fact why we need to have heat sinks. Okay, then it starts talking about the characteristic curve. So we have this, this is that breakover voltage they're talking about. If we exceed that, we could accidentally gate the uh, SCR as well. So it's kind of the same as what we talked about for a diode. It's just now we have kind of this, this two switch scenario still going on. So we have our forward bias section and then we have our gated section. So here's our gate connection. This is a bit different than the uh, drawing in your module, but the same, same principle. So the curve shows that the SCR is similar to a diode, again, in the reverse direction, where little or no current flows as the voltages increase until a reverse breakdown voltage uh, is, is reached. Again, we don't want that to happen. That would be at the expense of the uh, SCR. So we have no current flow in reverse bias right here. In the forward bias, we need to see that, um, we need to be able to reach past that potential and then also need to see this gate triggered. So we need it to be forward biased, reach that barrier potential, and then trigger the gate. Then we see current going through. So now again, we have this uh, scenario where we have two things that need to be met. Again, if we're still forward biased, but we haven't triggered the gate, we get into a position where if we wait too long, we could hit this breakover voltage and then accidentally trigger the gate when we don't want to. Okay, so those are the two things. So again, in the forward direction, shows that forward breakover voltage, similar to the reverse, but if no gate current is present, we're gonna reach that. Okay, if the breakover voltage is never reached, um, it's because we're gating it in the proper amount of time. Okay, uh, the IV curve shows the minimum holding current value indicated in figure 10, which is, should be close to this. Um, again, a little bit different, but this is its maximum peak operating voltage would be in this forward bias section as well here too. Okay, then it talks about commutating the SCR. Commutating again is to turn it off. So if it's gonna stay on, as long as that current is there, what we basically need is to get rid of that current and that will get uh, that will close that bottom switch what we were talking about and um, basically turn the SCR off or um, allow it to stop conducting. So there's ways we can do that. The different ways are natural commutation, frequency or AC commutation and force commutation. Natural commutation can be achieved by adding a switch in series or, or parallel with the SCR. So we have a switch now. Here's my load going through my SCR. Um, this is my regular circuit. Then if I add a switch around or in parallel of the SCR, if once I close that, it's gonna provide an alternate path for current to go around. Again, it's gonna take the path of least resistance. So if I, basically it's like shorting the SCR out. If I do that, the current's gonna go this way instead of through the SCR and it will commutate or turn off. Um, the frequency or AC commutation is also somewhat, in my opinion, happening, happening naturally, but they call it frequency or AC commutation. In an AC circuit, every half alternate cycle of the applied voltage reverse biases the SCR and it's commutated. So again, remember when we have our polarity switching from positive to negative and then negative to positive, there's only one section of this cycle, one alternation that gets through to the load. It's when we're forward biased. So if we're forward biased here getting triggered, it's going through. When we're over here, we're reverse biased. Even if we trigger it, it's not gonna go through to the load because we need both conditions to be met. But once the SCR is triggered in this cycle, the load's gonna see voltage until it gets to this point where we have basically no voltage and current and it goes right to zero before it starts going into the negative alternation and then commutates at that point as well too. 
Okay, so that's going to be frequency or AC commutation, obviously, because of our AC sine wave. Um, again, a gate pulse can turn on the SCR in this half of the cycle, only in this half because that's where we're forward biased. Uh, force commutation is applied primarily to the to SCRs in DC circuits where current continues to flow and must be forced off. So if we don't have an AC circuit, we're not seeing commutation okay, or AC commutation. In circuit A, once the on button is pressed, the current triggers the SCR in conduction. Okay, so when I press this button, sorry, the on button, when I press the on button, I'm gating it and I turn the um, SCR on again, it, if it's forward biased based on the polarity of the supply, which it would be because obviously you wouldn't hook it up reverse bias or it would never work. Once on, the SCR stays latched into conduction. Pressing off in the separate source circuit momentarily dis or sorry, momentarily connects the commutation source across the SCR anode to cathode. The instant this reverse biased circuit is connected, the, the SCR turns off. So they don't really do a good job marking it, and it's hard for me here doing it with this PowerPoint. But the polarity here is going to be such that this is forward biased. The polarity of this source is going to be such that it reverse biases the SCR. So even though it's conducting, as soon as I push this button, now it's going to get another uh, source applying to it that's going to reverse bias it. Okay, so that's definitely one way that we can turn it off as well, too. In circuit B, the capacitor charges to the supply voltage through the SCR once the on button is pressed. Okay, so here I press on again, I gate my, my SCR. When the off button is pressed, the charged capacitor is connected across the SCR and attempts to discharge through it. The discharge current re is reverse biased compared to what the supply is, okay, because it's going to be a discharge. And it attempts to uh, discharge through it. The uh, discharge current reverse biases the SCR and instantly commutates it and turns it off. So what we're doing with a separate supply here with a different polarity happens here with the capacitor as well, where we actually have this acting like another source with the opposite polarity as it discharges and reverse biases the SCR, which turns it off. Okay, so those are the different scenarios where we're going to see that. Then it gets into bench testing. We can bench test an SCR by using a jumper or to trigger the gate. So again, we just want to trigger this gate to test it to see if it come, uh, basically to see if it conducts. So I can take a jumper. Again, it has to have a resistance value to limit, excuse me, some of the current. And I could test to see if that would conduct just by kind of bringing a jumper over and putting um, um, positive supply. Again, positive, it has to be from this side. Um, from the anode to pulse that gate. Um, again, current limiting resistor included in that jumper. Otherwise, you get extremely high current and could damage it. So after the SCR is triggered and is conducting, you can commutate the SCR by carefully touching the jumper from anode to cathode. This momentarily interrupts the current flow through the SCR and turns it off. Basically, then what happens is if we just bypass the whole SCR, we provided a path for current to go around and it would commutate that SCR. So that's how you one way you could test it. Uh, the other way to talk about in your module, it has internal circuits that cause an ordinary diode check digital meter to show values on the display when placed across the SCR terminals. The figure below demonstrates a test that can be done with the digital multimeter in the diode check mode at the typical read and the typical readouts. To avoid false reading, you should always isolate an SCR from the circuit before checking it with a meter. And then again, always check the manufacturer's and supplier spec sheet when replacing the SCR. Okay, so these are typical readings you're going to get. Uh, whether we go, again, positive to negative for anode cathode, what we should read. We're basically going to test the forward biasing, reverse biasing, and then going to test the, the gate pulse to make sure it works. Okay, so definitely have a read through, through that as well. When we talk about the ratings, uh, the table below shows typical manufacturer specs that should be considered when replacing them. When replacing them, we need to consider the following. The voltage, the power dissipation, the DVD, DV, DV, DT rating, so the rate of change of voltage. Again, if that's too high, we could have false um, gating. Uh, gate current rating and the application. Okay, so these are all the ratings that we want to make sure we know prior to um, replacing those.
yeah, just to make sure that we are uh, doing it properly. Okay, so SCR applications. So we're, what circuits do we use these in? So they have several functions. They control the average voltage applied to a DC load from an AC source. And they control the output voltage of an alternator and can act as a switch in an electronic control circuit. So the first thing we're going to talk about is controlling the average voltage across the DC load. So again, when we do rectification, if we're talking about uh, half wave single phase, only one of these alternation get through because we only have one diode in the circuit. So on our positive um, alternation, we would could be forward biased. On the negative alternation, it would be reverse biased and block. Now, with the addition of the gate, we don't just have full voltage all the time like we did with the diode. We can tell the gate when to pulse and that's gonna decide when it starts. So that's called our firing angle. So if I don't only have a firing angle happening at this point, at this degree here, that's when it's actually gonna start conducting. So even though it's forward biased here, that's great, but we have to fire the, S, uh, the gate as well in order to actually have it conduct through to the load. So you can see that, that firing angle is represented right here, where even though we were forward biased, we didn't actually start conducting to the load until we gated that um, SCR. Then it stays on again, as long as the current is high enough. And in this case, it's going to commutate from AC or frequency commutation. Then when we get into this negative cycle, we don't see anything at the load because we're reverse bias. So even though I'm firing here, I'm firing it when it's reverse bias. And remember, there's two conditions that need to be met. We have to be forward biased and gated. So we're reverse biased in this alternation. So even though we're firing, it doesn't matter. We're not going to see it through because we're reverse biased. Then it happens again. I'm forward biased. And the first time the gate is, has a pulse to it, we start seeing load uh, or uh, voltage across our load. Okay. Um, again, the pulse to the gate has an earlier small firing angle and the conduction angle to the load is long. Okay, the thing with these um, firing and conduction angles, and hopefully we can see that clearly here, is that if my firing angle, whatever it value is, once it fires, it's going to conduct for the remainder of the cycle. So the whole cycle is 180 degrees. So the firing angle added to the conduction angle is always going to add up to 180 degrees. Okay, because it's whenever we're firing, that's when we start conducting after the first firing angle. So there would be a gap until we fire. That gap plus the conduction angle uh, would give us the 180 degrees. So earlier firing results in a greater conduction angle and a greater average voltage across the load. The triggering circuit sends the pulses at the same time and same angle in every alternation. Other pulses might be present until the alternation is ended, but they have no effect on the SCR since it's already conducting. So what's that saying is, is even though I'm firing here, I'm forward biased, and I'm still firing during this conduction portion, and the conduction angle is what the, is now the load is seeing this voltage, okay, but it's gonna be potentially less voltage because I'm missing out on this stuff right here. And if we fired later and later into the cycle, well, I wouldn't, uh, I'd see even less voltage here because I'm now I'm preventing the load from seeing this full alternation. So if the firing angle is increased, my conduction angle is gonna decrease and my load would see less voltage, okay? So again, it's okay that we hit this firing angle on the timing, it's hitting it all the time. Once it conducts, it can fire that gate all at once, it's gonna stay conducting as long as, until we drop below that current load, that holding current, which happens right here. And then again, now we're reverse biased, we have firing happening, but it's a moot point because we are reverse bias, so the load will see nothing. Okay, when the gate is fired with pulse B, the later the firing angle, or sorry, the later or larger firing angle, so an increase of the degrees in the firing angle, results in the SCR conducting current to the load for less time. Late firing results in lower average voltage across the load because of the smaller conduction angle. So definitely associate the conduction angle is when I'm, I'm actually putting voltage to my load. So in either case, the SCR commutates at the end of every positive alternation when the voltage current dropped to zero. 
So it's saying regardless of what my conduction or firing angle is, it's commutating based on AC commutation or frequency commutation. Every time it hits zero, it turns off. So this, in this case, my firing angle is way larger. Okay, obviously over 90 degrees, one could probably say even probably 135 degrees. My conduction angle is only about 45 degrees. Uh, or sorry, if I said 145, 35 degrees then, sorry, yeah, 35 degrees, sorry, my simple math there. Um, this is what the load's seeing. So a very small amount of that alternation and then nothing, and then another very small amount. So my, my DC average output is gonna be extremely small if my firing angle is this huge. Okay, but there could be, there could be an, a, a purpose for that. Um, we're gonna do a lab here where we actually change this firing angle and we are either increasing or reducing the voltage to the load. And where that's applicable for us is in like a, a dimmer switch for a light. If you increase the firing angle, you're gonna see less voltage at the load, so your light will be dim. If we decrease the firing angle, which increases the conduction angle, my light will be bright. Okay, so that's gonna be the lab that we're gonna do. Okay, and it'll help, uh, help kind of hit this stuff home. Uh, speed control of a DC shunt motor. Base speed is the speed of a, DC, uh, of a DC motor with rated voltage applied to both armature and field windings and the motor driving a full rated load. Figure below shows a DC shunt motor connected for rated voltage. Okay, so again, it's got rated voltage here and here, so this would be base speed. Nice uh, machines review for us. Here's our field winding shunt in parallel and our armature. To operate a DC motor above base speed, the current through the field winding must be reduced. Okay, so we put a real estat in a field, that's what we did. Uh, that's what we saw the most in, in our DC machines. We didn't really affect the armature voltage, okay? But to operate a DC motor below base speed, the current through the armature is reduced. Below is a circuit which could be used for speed control of a DC shunt motor. It uses rheostats connected in series with the field winding for above base speed uh, control and in series with the armature for below base speed. Okay, but ultimately, what are these SCRs doing? Uh, sorry, these are, uh, we'll get into the SCR. These rheostats are doing are limiting the current through these, okay? So if we wanna do that, we can actually use SCRs instead of rheostats too. So the figure below shows the speed control where SCRs are used to control the field winding current and the armature current by phase control of the average voltage across the armature field. So phase control, think of it as voltage control. So now I have something that's gonna allow me to affect the voltage. So it was 240 volt supply in here, but I can see um, less voltage going to either the field winding or the armature winding if I change the firing angle from this. So if the average voltage decreases, so does the current. So rather than affect the current with the rheostat, I can just ch literally change the voltage that's going to the armature of the field and I'll have the same effect. So now we can use SCRs in these circuits instead of rheostats to achieve the same thing. Uh, direct current drive with base speed uh, down control. Most DC drivers for DC motors operate by controlling the average voltage to only the armature of the motor. This is base speed down, so we just talked about that. Figure below shows a diagram of the basic arrangement of a control circuit for a DC motor using a full wave SCR bridge consisting of two SCRs and two diodes. So when we have SCRs instead of diodes, um, it's called a controlled bridge rectifier. Okay, and this is on uh, page 19. That's where I got this diagram from your module. So it's gonna go through the, the steps on how we're gonna do that. So we have, uh, the SCRs allow for phase control. Again, they're gonna be firing the same time as a diode so that we have now both, because it's a full wave bridge, we're gonna see both alternations. So we have to be able to control each alternation. So this trigger circuit here is basically what's gating our SCRs and deciding the firing or conduction angle. So how much voltage is going to that armature. Okay, so that's how they're gonna achieve that base speed down. Okay, so definitely have a, a read through that, uh, the process on the, on the module. I'm not gonna read uh, 
basically read straight out of the module on that. But definitely go through these uh, uh, diagrams, and we can go through these in lab as well too. Okay. Um, in figure 24, this single phase electronic DC shunt motor drive. Okay, so the field is energized as soon as the main disconnect is closed. So as soon as we close this main disconnect, the field is energized. So we've got power coming through and energizing the field. The current through the field winding energizes the relay coil FF. If the field should open, the FF current sensitive relay with relatively few turns of wire is de-energized. This causes the main contactor M to, to de-energize and no further motor operation is allowed. So basically we got this um, contact. So here's our, our basically our stop start. We have this FF contact that when it's energized, it's gonna close that, but we have a limitation to that, okay? If this field opens, okay, which would give us basically a series connection then, we need this motor to stop because otherwise we're gonna get into runaway. So if this, for any reason that we lose this field section here, that is gonna open this set of contacts and the motor will not start. So let's think of it as like a safety portion of that so we don't get into a uh, runaway scenario. Uh, the armature circuit is energized, the start button is pressed, energizing relay coil M. This causes the two M power contacts, which are normally open to close in the armature. So these guys right here. So once we press start, there's your M's getting energized, this closes and this closes, which sends uh, ha has a path now to the armature itself. So with proper gate triggering from T3, okay, so T3 is right here. That's these guys right here are going to the gates. So G1 to K1 right here and G2 to K2 right here. So these triggering um, circuits are right here and right here. With proper triggering, um, the motor starts and the CMF of the armature is fed to the triggering circuit. This feedback provides good speed regulation that is set by a potentiometer. So here's the feedback signal coming off the armature. It's going to sense the speed and it's going to make adjustments to the triggering time in order to adjust that speed. Okay? If the motor is subjected to greater load, it slows down. The CMF decreases and the pulse occurs earlier, so SCR1 and SCR2 have their firing angles advanced. As a result, the greater average current flows through the armature. This brings the speed back to normal. So it's sensing the speed here, making adjustments, and maintaining the speed. Okay, so that's kind of what it's doing. This is a single phase one. So then they kind of go through, I won't go through the reading on this. You can read through, it's not too terrible to understand, but again, we go through it in the, in the lab. Basically, the only difference is it's three phase. So we have three separate SCRs in our, uh, um, in our rectifier circuit. And there's our return for our three phase for each one has a diode and an SCR. Again, as soon as we have an SCR in there, we have control of the output voltage. And when we have control of the output voltage, we can control the speed in this case. Um, automatic voltage regulators for alternators. An alternator with changing load has terminal output voltage that fluctuates. Again, under load, it changes. Common method used to regulate or maintain the voltage at a specific value is, control, is to control the alternator field current. This affects the output voltage of the alternator. The function is performed by an AVR. An exciter is equipment that supplies current to the field of an alternator. Most alternators are equipped with rotating exciters, usually brushless. Okay, so we talked about this in machines as well too. The AVR takes AC voltage from the stator of the alternator, rectifies it, and applies varying voltage amounts to the exciter field. The AVR controls the current in the field of the exciter. Okay, so it's going to control this field here of the exciter. By controlling the field exciter, it controls the current in the field of the alternator. So again, we're generating here. This AVR is telling how much current's going through here, which is going to dictate how much is being induced into this portion of the rotor, which sends AC into this rotating rectifier, and then we rectify it and sends DC to the actual alternator field. A small change in current in the exciter field, so right here, produces a large change in current in the alternator field. Again, because we have small change here, we're inducing into these 
windings, going through a rectifier, and then to the alternator field. Okay, so that's how we talked about an AVR in machines, but that's kind of how it's worked. We just talked about, oh, hey, by the way, there's a bridge rectifier on here, and you guys just kind of took my word for it. And now they're just showing you exactly, hopefully with a bit more understanding, because we have um, talked more about this stuff now. Here's the electronic components of the AVR. Again, we have our, it's a, th a three phase here. Um, we have our external adjustment for our voltage, our pulse circuits for our SCRs. Read through on page 25 is gonna basically go step by step through this. If you have issues with that, we can read it together, but I'm gonna keep on uh, keeping on here as far as this module goes, because we gotta get, uh, gonna get through all this stuff. Um, the regulation and, sorry, an SCR as a switch in a control circuit, SCRs are often used in battery charging circuits to provide the taper charge of an automatic shutdown to the charging process. The figure below uses a Zener diode. The Zener diode safely conducts in reverse bias under certain conditions. The voltage of the Zener conducts is called the Zener voltage. Below the Zener voltage, does not, uh, below the, sorry, the Zener voltage, the Zener does not conduct. So it has to hit that voltage, then it will start to conduct. So a different type of diode. If the rated Zener voltage is applied uh, and a reverse bias, then the, the Zener conducts and maintains almost the constant Zener voltage from cathode to anode. So again, now this is in a reverse bias scenario and we see that voltage, then we're gonna see, and that's this guy right here, this eight volts. So once it hits eight volts, then it will start con to conduct. And when it does that, it will trigger that SCR. So it depends on what the actually battery is charged at as to whether or not it's going to conduct. And it's all based on what that Zener voltage is. So. When we have our, uh, our operation here, so it says to have a battery charging current, the charging voltage must be higher than the battery voltage at the positive terminal of the battery charger, must be connected to the positive terminal of the battery. Okay, so here's our center tap rectification here coming out of our supply. Um, the AC source connected to the transformer primary is stepped down to a safe charging voltage. So by transformer T1, by our supply transformer here, or sorry, on our supply transformer, but our transformer that has the supply and steps it down. Um, the battery to be charged is a 12 volt lead acid battery and it's connected between the positive symbol and Z. So positive, here's our Z symbol here and the positive symbol here. So here's our battery connection right here. Okay. Uh, T1, D1 and D2 make up a full wave center tap rectifier that supplies pulsating DC to the charging circuit. So that's this right here, our center tap rectifier. Before beginning the charge, the battery voltage is low. When the voltage of the first pulse from the rectifier rises above the battery voltage, the voltage from Y to Z is sufficient to make D4 conduct. Okay, so this guy right here is now going to conduct. A current flows through the gate cathode circuit of SCR1 causing SCR1 to trigger and turn on. So if D4 is conducting, it's going to trigger SCR1. Again, if that voltage is, is high enough. So uh, current flows through the gate cathode circuit of SCR1 and again triggering it, the battery is now being charged. When the pulse voltage from the rectifier drops to zero, SCR1 commutates or turns off. Each pulse from the rectifier causes SCR1 to trigger, conduct, charge the battery a little, then turn off. Okay, because again, we're, it's using that AC commutation because we have pulsating DC coming out of that center tap rectifier. As the battery is being charged, its voltage increases and SCR1 conducts later and later and commutates sooner and sooner. This provides the tapered charging of the battery. Um, figure 32, so this, I don't know if I got her here, yep. Yeah. Uh, provides the, uh, or sorry, compares the charging time during each alternation as the battery voltage increases. So again, our charging time is greater when there's a greater difference between the peak and the battery voltage. So as the battery voltage increases, it's gonna be on for less time and it's going to still commutate, 
but it's going to be doing that sooner and sooner. So it's basically not going to be charging for as much. So 32A shows the charging time when the battery voltage is less than 12, so right here. And figure 32B shows the charging time decreases as the battery voltage nears full charge. The distance between the vertical solid line shows the time when the charging current is flowing to the battery. So again, charging time here way greater here, less time as we near the actual battery voltage. Okay, that's objective one. I think I'm gonna shut her down and start again.